So we're gonna talk about DeFi, DLCs, and decentralization. But uh, before we really kick things off, uh, I want to go through each of these speakers and see what uh, they think DeFi means, and uh, essentially what is desirable about it in a Bitcoin context. Uh, perhaps like maybe other uh, unique nuances that a UTXO model is better. Uh, to achieve these things and perhaps uh, other unique innovations that, uh, you know, we might have not seen if uh, we're, you know, tunnel vision in our own uh, Bitcoin script. So we'll start off with Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Put me on the spot, huh? Oh, well, uh, first of all, thank you guys for the introduction and all that. My name is Jimmy Song. I'm a Bitcoin educator, I guess, and developer and entrepreneur and all that. Um, my my view on DeFi, I think, is uh, is what I think you would call as like a Bitcoin maximalist position. I I actually don't think DeFi is either decentralized or finance. And if the if you want to, uh, you know, dig deeper into that particular argument, there's a really good 48 page PDF called "Only the Strong Survive" that Alan Farrington and Big Al wrote. And the essential argument that they give it's not, uh, is that it's not decentralized because there is a central controller, right? Like, there's nothing decentralized about a loan. When you get a loan from somebody, it is centralized around the loan giver. Um, it's also not finance. Finance requires some productive asset underneath. So if you are, you know, so, uh, hello? If you are uh, selling oil or something, there is a productive asset, oil. And if you are selling oil futures, it is based on like the need to hedge on that oil or something to that effect. What you have in the Ethereum DeFi ecosystem is all of the worst parts of Wall Street with rehypothecation, lending, and, I mean, uh, leverage, and things of that nature on top of assets that don't represent anything real. It is all like governance tokens or something like that. So it is my personal view that DeFi is not something that you really, that's really desirable on Bitcoin. It's, uh, it, it's something that I think would turn Bitcoin into more like the traditional financial system. It would uh, essentially fiatize Bitcoin. So it's something that I, don't think, I mean, I mean, no doubt people are going to try to do these things, but I don't think it's good for the ecosystem, and I don't think it's something that really we need to worry too much about. Go for it. All right. Um, so I am a, uh, you know, radical free market libertarian, and uh, if the people want something, fuck it, give it to them, you know? So if they're like, hey, we want DeFi, and, you know, okay, you know, do, do what you want if it makes you happy. I think things like DeFi ultimately are just inevitable. Um, people are going to figure it out. Uh, you know, Ben will talk about that. You know, they do discrete log contracts. We can't really prevent people from doing something that they figure out how to do in Bitcoin, especially if it's uh, reasonably private. Overall, I define, and this gets a little bit more to the decentralization angle, I define four pillars of Bitcoin of things that I really think Bitcoin has to do. Decentralization, self-custody, privacy and scalability. I think that those are like four kind of unique pillars and maybe decentralization, someone, you know, corrected me. Maybe I should really be saying censorship resistance there. And mm -hmm. I think that that's true. So one perspective that I, that I see often in Bitcoin is that Ethereum smart contracts aren't worth shit because they don't have decentralization. You know, they don't have some properties. And, and I think that that actually might be the, the backwards uh, intuition. It might be the case for Bitcoin that we won't be able to achieve those four pillars unless we have smart contracts. That smart contracts actually might be playing a critical and central role in the development of primitives for self-custody, primitives for decentralization, for privacy, and for scalability. And because I want to see all of those pillars be incredibly strong and robust, I'm all for smart contracts. And DeFi is something that people want that is a part of that story. And I don't think that we can necessarily build the primitives for those four pillars without also enabling DeFi on the way. 
And in terms of you know, censorship resistance, people are paying hella fees for DeFi right now. So that would be a great source of security for the Bitcoin network. Wait, wait, Jeremy, but you, you just said I'm for smart contracts. Are you suggesting that Bitcoin doesn't have a smart contract platform? Um, or are you specifically referring to Turing complete smart contracts? So, so I'll hit you with this one. Um, <sighs> saying Bitcoin has uh, like smart contracts is kind of like looking at like a red Lamborghini going by and then painting your, your Acura red and being like, I've got a cool car too. Bitcoin has stuff that you can do. You can definitely drive a Acura, but in terms of the amount of composability that you have with Ethereum, there's actually an ecosystem. We may have smart contracts, but we don't have a smart contract ecosystem, and that's really the critical part of, of saying you have smart contracts in a way that somebody from Ethereum isn't just going to laugh at you. Well, I mean, but are you talking about Turing completeness or something, or, or is it just like the tools on top of it? Because those, those are because we do have like tools like Miniscript and things like that, which I think uh, definitely qualify as composability. So. Um, uh, no, I, I will say that they don't. Uh, Miniscript helps. Uh, it's a fantastic, I use it, piece of mm -hmm. infrastructure. Um, but Miniscript isn't like uh, Uniswap. Like uh, that's well, a, that's all right. So again, are we going back to Turing completeness or not? Well, U Uniswap isn't Turing complete either. So Turing completeness is really just like a you know, hypey buzzword. It's a means to an end of achieving uh, useful and interesting smart contracts. Uh, Uniswap is you know, like everything, uh, every function in Uniswap terminates uh, very quickly. So there's no Turing completeness required. Mm -hmm. Uniswap exists uh, in a limited form on uh, Liquid. You know, there, there's this mm -hmm. team called BitMatrix. They have uh, an implementation of something like Uniswap. But the, the issue you know, that I see, I think it's really, really incredible research. But it kind of misses some of the key elements of why Uniswap works, which is around how the liquidity actually aggregates. Uh, there's no liquidity aggregation in the BitMatrix version of Uniswap which gives you uh, worse uh, prices than you would get on an Ethereum version. Okay, all right. I just wanted to clear up that it's not about Turing completeness at all. It is about really tools on top of the smart contract language that you're talking about when you um, say smart contract. Tool, tools on top of, but I think that uh, there's a limit to what you can do with just tools on top of where Bitcoin sits today. Uh, you know, people who've been listening to my other sessions will know that I'm a like, covenants advocate um, and I'm working on you know, I'm shilling, you know, BIP 119 CTV as a path forward for some of these things. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'm on board to continue my research efforts into like more advanced things later. But that's sort of my, you know, plan of attack for bringing some of these things to Bitcoin. I, I, I want to give Ben time to introduce himself. We got a little bit too heated uh, right off the gate. Yeah, you guys took like... You guys look like everything I was going to say. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I kind of agree with um, both of them here. Like, I think like Jeremy's right. Like, the beauty of like Ethereum's smart contracts is like you don't have to have like an alternate network for your order book. Like the order book is on chain, and you can see like all the buys and bids and asks, and like actually go and find this. Like, um, I work on DLCs, and like this is a hard problem to do. Where you know, if you want to, like, we can build all the software, but finding a counterparty is like, oh, go on our Telegram and find someone to do a bet, or go on Twitter, and it's like. That sucks. Or you can have a centralized server like uh, Atomic Finance, where they just counter trade you on a centralized exchange, and you know that kind of works. But it's not DeFi as much. It's you know me trading against you using Bitcoin. And um, so I think that there are um, things that Bitcoin is lacking in that case. But we can build around this. Like you know, Bisc is a decentralized exchange that has an order book, and we you know we can replicate things like that. Or same with Join Market, and we can replicate things like that for smart contracts in Bitcoin. So I think you know there are ways to route around it. Like you know. Bitcoin is a like finite system that is hard to change. So we need to never have like our order book on chain, but it doesn't mean like we're a worse system. We can build basically the same thing, get almost the same user experience, and you know still do the same things and get all the fancy stuff. So on that note, Ben, uh, I think you mentioned uh, Bisc and uh, Join Market. What efficiencies do you believe, and like perhaps trade offs are there for having a coordinator versus not having a coordinator for you know whether that's privacy or liquidity or censorship uh, resistance as Jeremy alluded to yeah I think it's mostly a censorship resistance thing like um, like you know for joint market versus like wasabi you know someone if the government finds where the wasabi like uh, server is they can you know shoot it with a gun and you know now wasabi can't coordinate any more coin joints versus joint market is a little more decentralized and you know that can keep going um, so you, you going back for like the smart contracts way you know it's the same thing where um, like if you're um, so like uh, Atomic Finance, I think is like a really good example of how to do this. Where they do covered calls and DLCs, and they just they're always the counterparty in your DLC. And the way they don't like you know actually get wrecked on the price is they just go to a centralized exchange and make the counter trade. 
So then they just take a small spread there. And um, so you know, they're not taking any risk, they're, the user is, and they're taking a small spread to provide that service by taking you know, custodial risk on that centralized exchange. You can do that, but like, you know, if their account gets banned or the government shuts down the company, well, now that thing is gone and you lose that censorship resistance. I'll, I'll uh, riff on that a little bit. Um, who here has like, tried to trade on you know, an exchange when the market's really hot and the exchange is down? Right, okay. You know, like most people have had that experience. Uh, my uh, buddies over at like Gauntlet Network, they're like a you know, research firm for protocols. Uh, they have a new paper out that basically looks at AMMs in terms of uh, efficiency. And everybody knows that these AMMs like Uniswap kind of give you like worse prices most of the time. But they wrote up sort of a, I, I have to get into the weeds of the paper, but it's an analysis of the quality of execution you get. And one of the key things about having an on-chain you know, order book is that you get much better assurances that you're able to execute at all hours during all markets. So you know, Uniswap is sort of like a perfect market maker because it always has a, uh, you know, like a spread that it's willing to make. Uh, whereas when you're running a coordinator, the coordinator could, during the most important time of the market, choose to shut off and like maybe only takes the trades themselves or something like that. So uh, you know, there's sort of issues when you have uh, a coordination system that is not able to execute with the same guarantees as the you know actual chain. So there are some issues though if a coordinator is also a miner or someone who's uh, yeah like, settling these blocks, right? Yeah, I, so this is where I think like the word decentralization is very deceiving within this context is, yeah, you don't have a single company like Atomic Loans or something like that, 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 that can be shut down or whatever. But there's like eight different, you know, single points of failure. I mean, we, we've had Ethereum like have hard forks and stuff like that. They screwed up. You know, there, there are all sorts of ways in which something could go wrong on that thing that are that that you don't necessarily have uh exposure or, or that are not entirely clear what the actual risks are and they and like to call that decentralized i think is very deceitful and and yeah there there's an order book that's on chain and you can you can look at it or whatever uh, but but in a sense, it's it's still centralized, and it's like one kind of centralization versus another kind of centralization. Uh, but you know, they they've sort of like sold the public on, hey, this is decentralized because you know it's running on this Ethereum thing, which is really controlled by Vitalik and Ethereum Foundation. So I I. I don't like this kind of characterization. Yeah. Uh, maybe we need another word. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think at the end of the day, like I'm free market enough that I think that like the code's mostly open source so people can like see what it's doing themselves and that information does get out there. You know, you do mm -hmm. a lot of advocacy about mm -hmm. this. So I think it's not that people don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, maybe originally in the, you know, early days, the market didn't have time to ingest that information. Well, I mean, you know, because you're, yeah. you're, you're smart and you actually like study this stuff, but the average person that's in DeFi actually thinks it's decentralized. They, they, I, I think they actually think that there isn't, that they get around all of these regulations and stuff by doing it in this particular way and that they're not vulnerable to government action or something to that effect. I, I really don't think that's the case. I mean, you're smart. I, yeah, I get well, it. You, so, you understand it, but well, I don't, there, I don't there, think most There are actually do. a lot of ways in which the decentralized coordination provides a lot of value. So the term about what Ben was talking about in terms of uh, you really have to find that counterparty, I, I call that peer-to-peer uh, -peer finance, uh, you know, because it's kind of like DeFi, but you're always looking for the person that you want to work with. Uh, and, you know, there are, there are it is kind of like a subclass of like, you know, what you'd call DeFi. Uh, when you don't have a, a coordinator or need to find a direct counterparty, uh, the thing that happens, and, and you know, you can say like, oh, well, like they have a, you know, a master key to the, update the contract. So it's, you know, okay. But, you know, eventually you could imagine they don't have that. Uh, it, it's really hard to enforce against, uh, you know, like a million people using, you know, I don't think it's probably a million people, but a million people using Uniswap, it's relatively hard to enforce against someone there. Mm -hmm. You have to have a company, but the contract doesn't go down. Um, whereas when, you know, like if you're like the biggest like market maker and you're doing all these peer-to-peer -peer things, like you can just shut that person down uh, more or less. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with like both of you. I mean, uh, Jimmy's not like completely correct. Like, it's it's DeFi, but you know, uh, it's only decentralized as much as the, as the underlying blockchain is, which is mm -hmm. completely shut uh, centralized. There's like a few, only a few hundred non Amazon nodes, so you know, government can shut that down easily. But yeah, you are right. Like, you know, the alternative for us in Bitcoin is like peer to peer fi, and um, that is not as sexy. You know, it takes a lot more hard work and engineering problems. So we are working on that, but you know. Maybe, maybe let me ask a question mm -hmm. to Jimmy, which is, uh, I don't really care if it's called DeFi. Um, mm -hmm. It is something. Like, there is something that exists. And two, the two questions are, 
is DeFi something that could exist, or is it something that you think is just like a you know false combination of words? And then the second follow-up is like, well, then what would you call it? Yeah, um, I think it's a false combination of words, and um, and I'm not sure what I would call it. But I I, I agree that it's maybe. Um, it's like on some spectrum of regulatory risk or something like that, or uh, ability for the government, because like, it is very easy for a government to shut down a company. That, that we know, you, you just raid their offices and you're done. But if it's, if it's something like Ethereum, I, I think it's a little harder, right? Like you're, you're gonna have to be like, okay, well, Ethereum Foundation, you're in violation of securities law or something like that, and then, they, they, you know, there's like Moore's lawsuit, and it's not entirely clear because there's like all sorts of regulatory uncertainty, which kind of gives them some cover. But th this is the same story that I've seen over and over with all all coins. It's like they want to pretend they it, they're decentralized in name only, so they can get around a lot of the laws that already exist. But they are just as centralized as any company is. It's just that. There's this weird legal loophole where you keep this fiction of decentralization in a legal way to avoid all of the regulation that's actually out there that's meant to stop stuff like this from happening. So that that to me is like the like yeah, I get it. Maybe there's some small amount of value in being able to avoid that regulation, but I don't I don't know if that's necessarily like something that's lasting or can be expected that can be counted on uh, for a while. So Jimmy, would you say it's just non KYC gambling? Yeah, well, it's non KYC every well, it's non uh, you get around all the regulation, right? Like if you're doing an ICO, you you essentially don't have to do any of the, you know, company formation stuff or any of the audits or whatever. You essentially become a public company without filing any like uh, SEC paperwork. That to me is Ultimately, the point of a lot of these things, it's the ability to scam and make essentially what's a pink sheet stock, right? Like they don't file any of those paperwork. That's why they're on the pink sheet. Without this ability, uh, like while being able to like pump it in the same way that you would any, any anything else. So, so I'm not an anarcho-capitalist. Mm -hmm. Like I like regulations that stop people from like dumping toxic metals in the rivers. I think mm -hmm. that's good. But do you think that the state intervening in like free capital markets should be a thing? Because I, I personally just think that like the regulation should happen, you know, privately. That people, you know, authenticate their deals through, you know, private. And I, I'm you know, for that. But that. I mean, essentially, what what you're doing is they they have one set of rules, and a bunch of other people have another set of rules, right? Any any public company has to go through another set, and I don't think that's fair. Like you you should enforce the same rules. If it, if it's going to be one way, then yeah, people are going to be a lot more careful. I think in sort of a world where people grow up where you know there there are no rules there are no requiring requirements or whatever but what what we've got is basically a bunch of companies that don't have to report anything that uh that pretend they're one thing and can be anything that they want to be they give no investor protections to anything and you know they they can claim whatever uh but really like you get rug pulls and like fraud all the time and there's a reason why the SEC was set up, right? Like, like I'm not saying it's good or whatever, but they were set up because there was so much fraud going around that stuff. And really, it kind of should be in their purview because, the, I mean, they're using this decentralization meme as a way to get around all of that stuff. So let's assume good faith for a second mm -hmm. and uh, essentially that we move away from regulators enforcing this versus it being more in code. I'd like to maybe dive into the nuances taken uh for doing discrete log contracts, uh, you know, we're still using an Oracle, but there has been uh, specific ways to minimize uh, the trust in the Oracle. For example, like uh, it doesn't necessarily know who's betting. And then I'd like to perhaps dive into uh, some contract enforceability type stuff that, uh, you know, may be useful with uh, CTV perhaps after. Yeah, so in, in DLCs, these are contracts based off an Oracle or set of Oracle signatures. So, you know, if you're betting on the Super Bowl, someone's going to sign, you know, this person wins the game. And uh, that's how your contract executes. And you can use, like, multiple Oracles. And the nice thing really about this is you're completely private from the Oracle, unlike in on other of these DeFi systems where the or I just get the Oracle signature from, like, a peer-to-peer -peer network or, like, their website. And they don't need to know, like, any of my on-chain Bitcoin stuff versus, like, 
in the Ethereum DeFi space, you know, it's directly inside the contract on chain. Everyone can see exactly what I'm doing, all my contract terms, and it's awful for privacy. And it creates these bad incentives like a minor extracted value. They front run users and are able to do all these things, and it screws up the incentives for the system. Whereas in our Bitcoin DeFi space of like DLCs, we get all around this. We're like, I think we're just building it correctly where all the contract logic is off chain and we're only using the blockchain as a settlement layer of, you know, just we're doing one transaction to set it up and one transaction to get paid. Everything else happens off chain. So what about uh, in the event like uh, someone tries to bribe an Oracle, is it possible to have multiple Oracles or is there uh, some other way where if an Oracle says both outcomes happen, there's a way to prevent this? Yeah, so we have nice properties where you can't use multiple Oracles. So instead of like, you know, if you know, Vivek's a good friend, but maybe he's going to bet against me, he's going to be an asshole and, you know, sign the wrong thing. <laughs> so I'm going to trust um, all three of these guys. So, you know, these two are nicer to me sometimes. So they'll sign the correct outcome and I will actually get paid. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, maybe, maybe Vizic is also being a double asshole and um, he signs like, you know, instead of signing the wrong team won the Super Bowl, he signs both teams won the Super Bowl. Well, if he does that, he's going to reveal his private key. So now, you know, I, any future um, events, I can, you know, make fake events too and make them even look like more of an asshole. Or he can stake funds under that key and now if you had like say 10 Bitcoin under that, well now that 10 Bitcoin is mine. And so he has like an economic incentive to not lie, which is very nice. And um, you know, none of these DeFi things in um, other chains have this, they just sign messages and let it go by. And yeah. Sorry, uh, so I, it really bothers me that you still call it DeFi because it's like not decentralized. <laughs> well, uh, we asked for a name. You're yeah, gonna tell us yeah I, I mean, basically. It, it, That's I, why I suggested non-KYC gambling. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I mean, <laughs> it, it's something like that. But in a sense, like, um, it, yeah, there there are punishment mechanisms and sort of in incentive changes that you can make. But in, in a sense, it's still kind of centralized, isn't it? No, yeah. It's. I think uh, what Jeremy's saying, peer to peer mm -hmm. fi, is probably the best word to say. Uh, okay. But, fair um, Let's follow that. When I was working at Shirtbits, we'd had debates internally a lot, being like, "Do we call this DeFi?" I, I would always push against it. Like, DeFi is kind of kind of an ugly term in the Bitcoin world. Mm -hmm. But um, I think peer to peer fi is a really good way to say it. But um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, like a lot of things that we say, like they be the the, it's sort of like prescriptive versus descriptive. Uh, DeFi is not a descriptive word; it's a prescriptive word. Like people are calling this type of thing that people are doing DeFi, and at some point, like no one's even going to know what DeFi stands for. Be, oh, De no DeFi. one does today. Yeah, like so deficient. That's what we're it actually on this for. panel to figure out what it is. If any, it's, any, yeah. it's like the word blockchain. Like you know things like. You know, like Bitcoin is a blockchain. Now there's this like things that are nothing like, you know, there's no like blocks. They it's still a call point. them blockchains. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, okay, well, when people say blockchain, there's something you're talking about of like having a, you know, you know, sort of checkable, auditable history of things. And you can say all you want, like, that's not a blockchain. It's not a blockchain, but we're probably going to have more success, like going back to calling Bitcoin a time chain than we are telling people to stop calling things blockchain. Exactly. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, Jeremy, you want to talk about perhaps like how, uh, you know, some of the reg regulatory concerns that uh, Jimmy had expressed can maybe a bit more enforceable through code, through potential soft works uh, and uh, covenant like mentalities. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would say, you know, like just on the regulatory stuff, I don't have you know too much more to say on that. But I, I would say like, you know, Gary, if you're watching, you know, I love you. You're great. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't I don't see why we would want like an incompetent organization run by a bunch of people who know nothing about like the cutting edge of, you know, like what we're working on to be making rules for what we should be doing. Like, I think, yeah, if like the SEC were like perfect, like, you know, that would be great. They could just like write the Uniswap contract code for us and be like, this is like what everybody should be using because it's the fair one. But ultimately, like they have no idea about this stuff. So for them to make the rules is kind of preposterous. Um, in terms of like, in, like, that's where it's, I think it's just two separate questions, but the well, well, how bears. can we essentially like through code, uh, yeah. make our own investor protections? Yeah. Like so I think that what that comes down to is building out a culture around the smart contracts that we're doing that has auditability, uh, and you know, provability and static analysis just baked in as things that we're expecting any contract DLCs are fantastic in this regard. Uh, because for a discrete log contract, the output of compiling one is a list of transactions and you can have a third party, you know, like software that you're running that validates that like you are happy with every one of those outcomes and there's no like secret sneaky like Ben steals the money. So that, that's something, is there a secret sneaky Ben steals the money in it? 
I'm not going to say. Okay. So <laughs> anyways, you can guarantee that that doesn't, you know, Welcome like exist, to DeFi. Um, you know, with, with auditing and analysis tools. And that's something that like, you know, the, the, the bad guys are always like super clever. And I will say to the credit of the Ethereum community, like they have a lot of people who are working on like, hey, we want to weed out the bad guys and we want to make the, you know, bugs and flaws like more clear and bright as day. You know, there are tools for checking that the code is the same thing that was plugged into Solidity on the contract. That was a pretty early thing that they had. That's something we work on in Bitcoin all the time, too. We want reproducible builds of Bitcoins that, you know, the developers can't sneak in things. So that's something that, yeah, you know, like they're, you know, they work on the problems. In terms of how we can do it on Bitcoin, uh, I'm working on Sapio, which is a tool for creating very high level. Uh, high level can sometimes be bad because you're like, oh, this is, you know, I don't know what I'm actually getting. But high level can actually be also really good when you're able to prove things about the high level semantics and prove through through small steps that like this original thing goes to this thing and these things have the same for all passes and this thing goes to this thing and we prove the semantics are the same all the way until you get down to the Bitcoin blockchain. And if you do things that way, you can kind of look at a small piece of thing, look at the proofs for it and then feel comfortable that you're getting something that matches your expectation. At the end of the day, none of us are going to be reading bits and bytes. And being like, oh, I see this byte is wrong. You, you just can't really understand, you know, like a byte. You know, I mean, maybe maybe, ben Ann, maybe Andrew over assembly. there. Can, he's looking. Yeah. And he's like, I read the bytes, but like, <laughs> you know, us mere mortals are not reading the bytes. And uh, I think that that's something where having these high order tools. Like, I would love if you could, you know, look at a Sapio contract as a non programmer and say, well, I kind of see the piece of information. I see what's going on. Other people maybe use this one. Have attested. I built it myself, the build matches, the builds, and those are like things you can have happen automatically on your system. And then you'd say, okay, well, I feel comfortable sending money to this because I've you know, checked it out enough. I think a good point to highlight here is like all these Bitcoin smart contracting things we're doing are client side validated. So when I download the software, I'm building all the transactions that's possible. And the only way for you know, to have the Ben steals the money thing is that the software is built bad and I replace like my address um, or like you know, the user's address with my own addresses. And Ethereum and all that stuff, like that's just a, the contract is on the blockchain. You have to, you know, you can verify it on there, but you know, you have to know the intricacies of the EVM and Solidity and all that stuff. Versus this, you just have to see, okay, does the transaction I start with and the transaction I end with is that what I want? And um, it's a lot easier to validate. It does require more work on the programming side, and you know, you have to store all this data and manually validate yourself instead of just trusting the blockchain to do it for you. So it just has different trade-offs, but um, you know, that's the way we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am a little bit skeptical of like um, non-coders like being able to parse contracts. Like I, I, I've, I've been working in the you know like coding industry for a long time, and this is like the holy grail that everyone wants is okay. How can we uh, abstract the logic so like business people can actually do it? They never think of all of the corner cases. Never, ever. I've never seen it. And it's like, oh, well, they can make the decisions, but then it's like up to the coder to fix it later anyway. So I mean, even the yeah. ETH developers can't do it. Like there's lots of like very yeah. interesting things where it's like, you know, if they, these two lines need to be switched in order for this like accidental rug pull to not happen. Yeah. It's, it's super hard to do. So like that's kind of the beauty of client side thing where it's just like, we're just having these two transactions and we expect it to work right because there's, my addresses are on both. In, in a sense, this is where like, like, Ethereum's really kind of terrible is that it, it is very complex. And the, the minute you make it even a little more complex, it's, it is extremely difficult to analyze. And it's like, ah, oh, I'm not sure what this is going to do. Uh, well, what, what we're, we're, we're all like disagree on this mm -hmm. is like, uh, Ethereum is like much more just like a research project on how to do like a, a big, you know, uh, let's call it a decentralized organization that processes smart contracts. And there are things that can happen that make a lot of these things like way better than they are today. And it's just because like they're a little bit fast and loose. But ultimately, you know, like they've got like thousands of computer scientists who are like, you know, you can say that they're working on a pile of shit, but it's like, you know, like a structure built on top of a pile of shit. The structure built on top might not be crap. Uh, and, you know, like like a lot of places are built on landfill and then an earthquake, they all go under, but the houses are beautiful. Uh, and you've got these brilliant computer scientists like dedicating their careers now to like solving some of these problems. Uh, and, you know, in the smart contract space, we have, you know, some people who are working on it. Like we've got, uh, you know, Russ O'Connor and, you know, he's like definitely, you know, our 10x or 100x engineer on like the future of like being able to verify semantics of smart contracts and stuff. But, you know, like they're building stuff too and like it can get better just because it's bad right now doesn't mean that it's not going to like improve over time. And they're doing a lot more. So like I just think, you know, it's sort of like where there's smoke, there's fire. There may be a lot of smoke of like things that are kind of shit, but like 
maybe there's some like real signal there. And yeah, the beauty of this is it's all open source. So it, anything that's actually innovative, we can just copy paste. Um, and uh, we, like a Bitcoin kind of has Go already Bitcoin. like there is a rootstock side chain that has um, the Ethereum EVM. There's like Aave and Uniswap, all these already on them. Just no one uses them because really Bitcoiners aren't interested in that. I think it's like the main reason like, you know, I buy Bitcoin and I just hodl it for you know the next 30 years. I don't want to gamble it. Versus like, you know, Ethereum people, their main use case is buy $100 on Coinbase, put in their browser wallet and go gamble on an NFT or something like you know, it's very different use cases where are you know markets that we're treating here so I think that's the main reason why we're not seeing an explosion like you know, on something like rootstock that has all the exact same functionality it's just denominated in Bitcoin oh quickly because you said the the dirty word NFT uh, I know Vake <laughs> asked out there uh, how do we all feel about rare pepes Booger Pepe is the best one <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't see them as valuable, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean they're they're a database entry that you know that attests to some piece of art outside of the chain. You you got the Oracle problem and stuff. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. You should you should just host a thing on your website and say okay these people own this or whatever and that's it. I, I don't I don't understand how like because it's on Ethereum or Bitcoin or something that so, it uh, suddenly makes it more uh, valuable. Oh, I have to say if you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if you want to send me one, I'd love to have it. That's all I <laughs> Vic, you got to say. you got a buyer, you know, reach out to Jeremy privately. Um, and I'll say, like, I think, like, I think rare Pepe's are the best version of NFTs because I think NFTs are just for the memes and, you know, Pepe's are memes, so. Fair enough. <laughs> Maybe so, they encode memes better than um, actual JPEGs. <laughs> so I, I really like Jeremy's uh, perspective about like radical free markets, uh, but th that is also a double-edged sword. Uh, you know, there's permissionless building, but there's also a permissionless destruction. Uh, as node operators, I wanted to ask you guys, is there things we can do to like identify transactions and not relay them or, you know, like invalidate blocks? Like, is there any like uh, counter punches uh, that we can duke this all out on a network level? Would you want to? Uh, I don't know. Like that—that well, that, that well, seems like like UASF kind of stuff. Well, to me. UASF, but uh -huh. in a, in essence, like if they're misusing uh, what we believe is uh -huh. scarce on chain mm. versus the client side perspective that Ben was highlighting. And you can say like the DAO hack, like you know they mm -hmm. censored that contract because they didn't like it, but um, you know what well, they reversed it. They yeah. didn't censor it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Versus like you know, and if they're using something like a DLC, they can't exactly see what's going on. They just see you know mm -hmm. this thing and this thing. They couldn't see like how he broke it or anything like that. So you know there is some um, nice things like that where. In Bitcoin and DLCs and even Sapio stuff, like you can't really tell exactly what their entire contract is. It's just like all you know, like we said, all of their contract logic is off chain. It's only settlement on chain. So you know, when someone's doing a contract, they can um, like you know, if I'm betting Vivek on the Super Bowl, no one knows that I'm betting on the Super Bowl. They just say, oh look, they funded a multi sig and then spent it. That's all they can see. They we could have been betting on you know the Bitcoin price. We could have been betting on an NFT price. We could have been betting you know on how many people show up to this thing. We could bet on anything, but. You know, we've been on the Super Bowl and no one knows that. And, um, or we could just fund it a multi-sig and spend it because, you know, we like Green Wallet or something. Like, it's very different and versus, like, you know, these other systems are completely um, open and they can see exactly what contracts are being doing. And it creates problems in the systems where you have miner extracted value, where they front run this and you create weird incentives for miners. Yeah, I think uh, that actually was where I was going to take it a little bit. Uh, I've got, like, maybe two points. One is... Uh, Honestly, like I just don't care if somebody wants to do a transaction on the network. I think we shouldn't really, uh, you know, check too much other than like, hey, are we reserving this for future upgradability? Um, and if so, like probably we shouldn't let people, you know, use something that will change semantics one day. Um, but what example of this recently is I proposed that we should uh, get rid of the dust limit because if somebody really wants to create a zero value output, I don't see like, you know, why I wouldn't just let them do it. There are reasons around like, oh, well, like you know, people have this concern, like what if the network just becomes like everybody only creating zero value outputs and then they never have any incentive to spend them. And, and my perspective overall is like, you know, this, this free market side is like, well, like I'm really glad that they found so much utility in Bitcoin that they decided that it was worth paying the very expensive network fees and contributing to the security of the chain on an ongoing basis to create these zero value outputs that you're saying have no utility to you. Like it must have done something for them that made them happy uh, and, you know, like if it helps everybody else, but you people worry about the ongoing, which I think is your point, like the maintenance cost of like, well, you have to maintain these zero value things for a long time. The UTX um, it. And yeah, I think it's a problem, but um, you know, ultimately like I think miners will end up doing what's rational for them and that'll be mining transactions that pay fees and I don't think they care as much about the maintenance of the UTXO set. 
So maybe that's something socially we can solve for that like, oh, we've got like a norm. Um, and there might be some things around like renting, you know, the UTXOs where you rent the space on the UTXO set. And if you're not paying enough, you know, like sats, you've got to like, you, you, let's say you lose one Satoshi per block or something like that. I don't know. I think it's a bad idea for a number of reasons, but that people are like, oh, we kind of want something like this because we want people to have, you know, incentive to not create it. I don't know how to solve that. Um, but the, the other point that I would talk about about MEV is like MEV is just already like here in Bitcoin. Uh, unless you want to like cancel the Lightning Network and delete it, like Lightning introduces an immense amount of MEV into Bitcoin, uh, and uh, you know I want Lightning, so I think that it's one thing to be like, oh, like we don't want to add more MEV, but I think there's already enough MEV with Lightning that you know. Can you, know, can you say what payment. MEV is? Oh, so MEV is minor extractable value. Mm -hmm. That means like if miners were like really naughty, they'd be able to get more money than if they were nice. Mm -hmm. uh, so. It's a thing where, like in Ethereum, you'll have. Uh, and I think uh, mm -hmm. Jimmy Brent mentioned this briefly earlier. It's like for Uniswap, a miner can reorder your transactions, and so they might like, you know, put a coin in and like, you know, change how much liquidity is available. So, so, so let's say a miner has like a lot of coins. They might like pull the, pull all the liquidity out of the market, so that you're going to have a ton of slippage on your trade, and then your trade executes and they put their money back in. So, that, so it always looks like the trades are available, but the miner executes in a way that they pull the liquidity, mm -hmm. rug pull you, and then you have slippage and you get a worse trade. The nice thing with you know Uniswap in particular is they mm -hmm. have like a, an anti-slippage clause that makes it so that your transaction just won't execute if you get too much slippage. But it is one of these things where miners have the ability to get that threshold of slippage theoretically every single time. Mm. So. Yeah, and th this is where like I, I do think uh, having some like individual choice is very important. So like you, we we had a long time ago bear multisig, right? And those are some really huge UTXO outputs. So. They they pollute the UTXO set seriously, and you know they're still like, you know the the one that uh, I want to read the white paper. Jamie. Yeah, the the white paper one that that that's got like nine hundred and thirty seven outputs of you know one satoshi each, and they got it's like um, one hundred and ninety six bytes or something per UTXO, whereas like a normal one is like twenty or twenty five or something like that. So it th that to me is like. Okay, you have to be concerned with the fact that the UTXO set is sort of like a shared resource. Um, now, there, there are some sort of things that you can do, like just sort of already, right? Like you can split your coins to like the dust limit as much as you want. And, you know, um, in a sense that that would like pollute the UTXO set significantly. Like how far do you go? I, I, I think it really should be kind of up to individual nodes to decide. We don't really have tools for that or anything, but... You know, we, we don't want them to be centrally controlled either. So, yeah. I think it's really just about, like, aligning the incentives inside mm -hmm. Bitcoin itself. So, like, like with Segwit, it um, changed the incentives. We're now creating, like, um, using less inputs and more outputs, like, you know, or, yeah, in the inverse, using more inputs and creating less outputs is the economically advantage. advantage. So, mm -hmm. you you know, you shrink the UTX set naturally. And things like that is, like, what you kind of want to do where... You know, we, we can't just tell people, stop pulling the UTXO set, but, you know, if we just say, if you do that, you're going to pay more fees and lose money, then it shouldn't actually happen ourselves. Hmm. So one cool thing that I'd like Ben to quickly highlight, which I consider Bitcoin DeFi, ew, ugly word again, <laughs> but, uh, you know, stable channels... <laughs> Yeah, stable channels are pretty interesting, uh, you know, potentially down the line when we get DLCs and lightning channels to represent like CFDs for USD values. You want to talk about that a little bit, how it's done, why? Yeah. Why don't you explain what a CFD yeah, yeah. is? <laughs> you said a lot of words that a lot of people don't know. So a stable channel, or a CF and which is enforced by CFDs, is um, so it's like, say... You know, you're so we actually get a lot of requests from this from like the HRF to try to build this. Where you know, there's people in El Salvador, they're using Lightning, but you know the Bitcoin price fluctuating a lot can you know really affect them since they don't have a lot of money and um, you know it's not their savings, it's their spending wallet, and they need to buy groceries tomorrow. So they want it denominated in dollars, not Bitcoin. Well, you know, Lightning doesn't send dollars; it sends Bitcoin. So the way you could do this is you would open a Lightning channel and immediately open a DLC on top of that Lightning channel to your counterparty saying. Let's bet on the big or on the Bitcoin price. So then, um, at the end of the week, or you know, when I close this channel, I want to get my dollars worth back that I opened today. So if I opened a hundred dollar, a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin to Jeremy, at the end of the week, I'm going to get a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. You know, it could be you know, I could start with one Bitcoin, end up with two. I could start with one Bitcoin, and end up with point one, depending on how the Bitcoin price goes. And that's kind of the goal. So like things like this, um, you know, other ways of getting like dollars on Lightning is like things like like RGB and using tokens, but there's lots of problems like free options and all the stuff that gets hairy, but 
using this lets us do this. And it, the nice thing is too, it's um, you know again private. Like when people see me send a tether token on Lightning, they can see I'm sending tether. But in this, they just see it's just between me and Jeremy. And they can't tell what I'm doing. So that's another really nice property. And um, there is lots of like demand for this. Yeah, one of the the cool things that I uh, I worked on a while ago, but I only recently put up some of the code from it is uh, something similar where you have a channel that has a CFD, but the CFD is uh, uh, for uh, the changes in hash rate. So you know, it doesn't even need an oracle, but you can uh, basically have a peer-to-peer uh, -peer FI contract, which lets you uh, trade on like hash rate derivatives. This is the POW swap, right? Yeah, yeah. What, what do you use, like bits field on the header or something uh, like that? No, you, you have one, one transaction. It, it's basically a, um, a block delta conference, uh, uh -huh. contract. and. Uh -huh. What you do is you say, um, here's a specific date in the future, let's mm -hmm. say six months out. Mm -hmm. And at that date, I'm able to execute one leg of the trade. Mm -hmm. Or if I see a certain number of blocks, I'm able to execute. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so either the time slips or the... Uh, so there's a block number or a Yeah, or a, or a time. Okay. And whichever one hits first uh, is the one that executes. And mm -hmm. it's metastable. If anybody knows that term, it means like... If it's if the difference is too small, you mm -hmm. could get either execution, which mm -hmm. you know kind of makes sense. But mm -hmm. if the difference is large enough, you have enough time to execute your thing. Mm -hmm. But where it's neat is that if you just did that on chain, you'd be kind of locked into it. Yeah. But you can do it in a channel, and then you can high frequency trade, updating it into a perpetual <laughs> version of that. Where I see. You know, see. and then if the counterparty stops, uh, you know, trading with you, you just close it out. Oh, interesting. Well, so it looks like we're probably going to have to wrap it up soon. Uh, I want to get through like a summary, maybe last words. Uh, once again, if we do call it DeFi, what does it mean? Or what's a better word for it? Uh, for me, it's non-KYC gambling, but uh, <laughs> make it accessible. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I like P2P Fi or peer-to-peer -peer Fi because it, it, it kind of is. And it, it sort of highlights the fact that you are dependent on the peers that you are depending on, right? Like, so if it's an oracle, then it's an oracle. If it's a contract for difference, then it's whoever your counterparty is. And uh, it, it's up to them. Uh, like making sure that they're not cheating you or something, and there are ways in which you can sort of enforce that. But that that seems to me like a more accurate uh, version, and I think it highlights sort of like the the risks that you're taking because it is definitely dependent on the peer that you are. I would say the stuff on Ethereum is maybe more dependent on the actual contract and whoever wrote it um, and what it, what it, whatever it is that they're doing. So. Maybe it doesn't quite fit there, but uh, but there there's an aspect to it that like that's maybe unique to Bitcoin in a bit, in, in a way. That that's what it seems like to me. Jeremy, um, yeah, I think that uh, if I had to leave people uh, with anything, it'd be like the peer to peer fi is coming kind of you know thing. Like it's gonna be here. Uh, you know, you can you can work on it. You can play around with it. Uh, build a business on it. Uh, you know, there's lots of different things that are gonna be big opportunities. Uh, I'm really hoping that uh, you know Sapio is going to be a tool that's useful for people wanting to experiment and build stuff um, in this space. Um, so if you, you want to check that out, it's learn.sapio-lang.org. Uh, and also, I'm trying to get BIP 119 checked out by Verify in so that we can uh, you know get the smart contracts to ensure the four pillars of decentralization, scaling, privacy, and self custody. And I think that's going to help us fulfill the you know actual vision we all want Bitcoin to. To uh, you know, well, Satoshi's vision. All right, Ben the Cornman. I'll say uh, DeFi is for bears, Peter Purify is for bulls. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been told that uh, we have a little time for questions, so uh, feel free to hop up. Um, I think we could probably take like two or something like that. Check, check. I feel like one of the missing puzzle pieces to a lot of conversation like regarding regulation and DeFi and decentralization um, could be talking about webs of trust and reputation systems. Do any of you have any feelings about using that as a method to replace like, you know, regulation and judiciary aspects? I mean, in DLCs at least, we kind of get that with the oracles with like all the punishment mechanisms and fraud proofs of them lying. So you kind of get that inherently with that. And um, same as like lightning nodes, you know, you have this pub key that you do lots of things with and sign messages. I don't know. Yeah, sure. Why not? I, I think they're important. Uh, I don't think we figured them out yet. And I think that requires a lot more experimentation. Uh, yeah, I'd love to add that. Like, I think the more options, the better. Uh, 
personally, I'm not a big fan of the boss score specifically for Lightning because uh, Tor nodes are second class citizens. Mm. Fair enough. Thanks. Are we done or one more? Uh, one more. Um, I just have a, a general question. So, Jimmy, you had mentioned uh, Alan Farrington and Big Al's article, mm -hmm. Only the Strong Survive. And I, I love that article, but I, I think even in the title, it implies that there will be some aspects of DeFi that will be strong and will survive. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that article was predicated on this idea that DeFi has no ultimate productive asset. But with Bitcoin, I think there are ways to financialize productive assets. Like if we took something like miners and created hash rate derivative contracts, you know, we give them a way to almost like lock in the future value of their hash power and allow them to build out, say, more renewable facilities or just kind of uh, better manage their cash flow. And the same thing on Lightning, um, with Lightning leases, whether that's, uh, you know, ads or um, Lightning pool, you know, that and is an ultimate pretty, productive yeah. asset where if somebody puts their Bitcoin into the channels, then, you know, you get ultimate Bitcoin yield. Sure. So the point I'm making is that there are ways to create finance out of the most productive <laughs> asset, which is Bitcoin. And so my ultimate question is, do you see any light for Bitcoin if we're using DeFi to aid the actual Bitcoin network? And I just gave two examples of mining and uh, like channels. Yes. Yeah, yeah um, I, I, I would say that the article spe specifically that you mentioned defines DeFi as like actual decentralized finance. And it is possible that we, we do get something like that and we don't know the future. And there are certainly innovations in that regard that I think we can go towards, especially with something like Lightning Network. Um, but, you know, as far as this particular iteration of DeFi as seen on, uh, as seen on uh, Ethereum, I, I, I really don't think it's decentralized or finance. So I, I, I don't, yeah, it's, it's hard to answer your question because you're asking for yeah. future predictions. I, I, I would add on to that, that the two examples you gave are excellent examples of how more smart contracts lead to the fulfillment of the four pillars that I defined where, hey, if we can get hash rate derivatives that allow miners to expand their operations, that gives us more, hopefully, decentralization. And if we can have uh, financialization of, you know, like lightning, that can lead to more scalability. So we're, we're wrapping up. This yeah, yeah they, they're, they're like yelling at us back there with their hands. Yeah.